So, hello everybody, everybody who's listening live and everybody who listens into the future. Uh, this is Charlie in the podcast or Zoomcast, To Hell and Back. Uh, it's the first one of these I've done in a few weeks. Um, while I've been adjusting to just all of the alterations of uh, being at home that everybody else is adjusting to, and it just has thrown me off from my usual game. Um, in, in that respect. So anyway, I'm glad to be back and to take an hour with you and to talk about uh, something other than the pandemic. Um, I was talking about the pandemic and uh, certain perspectives on it and skills to use during it, but actually I decided on this one that there's so much of that going on, at least in my awareness, uh, there's so many people presenting such great stuff about how to cope and what the stressors are and all of that that I just decided, no, you know what, just go back to um, just teach something that, um, and do what my original plan was when I started all these podcasts, which was to um, make myself anxious enough uh, before talking for an hour that I would dig deeper about different concepts and maybe discover something, a different way to put things, a different way to understand things. And so that's what I'm doing today. Um, so uh, I also want to emphasize, because I don't usually say it at the beginning, but um, uh, that I do this in conjunction with uh, National Education Alliance with Borderline Personality Disorder, NEABPD. And, uh, and so I, I try to coordinate with them and things get advertised where also to them and also about this. And it's a, just a fabulous organization. If you've never gone to their website, it's just like one of the treasure chests in the world of borderline personality disorder and DBT, more than you can imagine, uh, and really well done. So um, I encourage you to do that. Um, I want to start by talking about uh, my fear of public speaking, and then you'll see why. Uh, he's afraid of public speaking. Oh my God, he gets on this podcast and he just sits there and talks to his computer. It's not exactly public speaking, but I know some of you are out there. And it, so it, is, it does make me anxious, but not like it did in the good old days when I was younger, I'd say up until my mid, mid to late thirties. Um, so I want to talk about it as a, uh, because it's one model of having a repetitively painful emotion uh, that I thought I knew a lot about and I wasn't changing. And I just kept going through it and kept going through it and kept going through it and gaining insight about it and trying to understand where it came from and trying to think of how, how crazy it was. Uh, and yet it didn't change. So I, I, I'm going to use that at the moment as a model. Then I'm going to talk about uh, other, uh, I'm going to talk about a way of understanding it that I think you can extrapolate to any painful repetitive emotion. I mean, I'm guessing so far, uh, the, all the examples I think of and the people I work with um, and my own emotions, it, it applies everywhere. So I think it's a really useful tool. Um, you're going to hear about it in a way that is different than it's presented in DBT. It's just a different way I organize my mind about it. Um, and you wouldn't have heard it this way before. Why? Because I came up with this way of organizing it literally today. Um, but it has all the same ingredients that DBT has. I just think it, it's an area of DBT that sometimes I think is hard to teach well and get it across so that people can really change their emotional, uh, rela their relationship with their own emotions. So that's the goal today is that. The goal isn't to tell you about my fear of public speaking, but that's the vehicle. When I was younger, I mean, when I was really young, I mean, I don't think I cared that, that much about it. Um, I, I guess the part, what I'm talking about now is what rendered me so vulnerable to this fear, because I don't think it was there when I was six. I don't think it was there when I was 10, and I don't think it was there when I was 15. But by the time I was 18, it was definitely there. And I can't really trace exactly what happened. There were some events that happened when I was uh, in high school, uh, two public speaking events that went very badly that I felt terrible about. And it's amazing how one or two experiences can color you from then on if they were, uh, if they were powerful. Um, yeah, one was I got up to give a speech when I was a freshman in high school running for sophomore class president. 
at the end of the freshman school year and I stood up in front of my class of 400 and five of us were running for president of the sophomore class. And um, I decided my speech I would give without any notes. Uh, I would just memorize it and everybody else was using notes and I thought that would give me an edge. Uh, so I did it and I got up there and I stood there for about 30 seconds, unable to remember the first line which was the way I was going to start because I had practiced a thousand times and I couldn't think of the first line. So I just said, I, I can't remember my speech. And I sat down and I was humiliated and I came in fifth place out of five. Uh, and that was a painful experience. I had another painful experience as a senior in high school. I won't go into, but it was another, another one where it was, I really forgot stuff and fell apart uh, in a public speaking situation. At, Fast forward through a lot of years during which I wasn't necessarily a teacher or speak, but later I was becoming a teacher as a psychiatrist and I was teaching psychiatric residents and medical students. And I noticed that with every presentation, I was terrified. I mean, where'd this come from? I mean, I hadn't had terrible failures of doing that, but I was, I, I was relying on really making my talks uh, great, you know, like uh, as perfect as possible, and I would practice, and I would, and, and this would be for maybe six psychiatric residents to teach them about something I already knew about. So it was clearly over, overdone, and I was, it was clearly out of control a little bit, and then I would do it, and I'd give these speeches, talks, lectures, and, uh, and, I, and, and it got, lo and behold, it would be exhausting for me, to prepare and then do it and then be uh, anxious. And then afterwards, people would say, oh, that was great. That was really helpful. Like they wouldn't say this is the best thing I ever heard, but they'd say that was really good. Thank you. That was really good. And I think, oh my God, thank God I overprepared because who knows what would have happened if I had just walked in and talked. I mean, so I was reinforced repeatedly for uh, um, that kind of anxious approach. And just, and so I knew, I knew over time, cause I knew this was crazy. And I knew over time, you know, you're a good speaker. I knew over time, it goes fine. I got good marks for as a teacher. I got my points across. I would try to use that to convince myself to change my thinking about it so that I would change. And then I would like calm down and just go teach. Cause I wanted to be a teacher. But I was now being, I was now making myself crazy all the time. Um, then I started giving bigger talks uh, about psychiatry, first about psychoanalytic approaches to borderline personality disorder uh, with Otto Kernberg's model. And I would give speeches and I would go with him and present things and I would write articles. And then I started doing DBT work, um, I guess in my late 30s would have been, yeah. And so uh, it became very noticeable then because I'd go to teach audiences that were bigger and that I didn't know. And I would go to give a talk that was going to be 45 minutes at a conference. And the night before, I would already be in my third day of preparing what I was going to say. And then that night, I couldn't sleep because I had to go back over it. And then at two in the morning, I would look at it. I would say, this is shit. Who would ever present this? I mean, this is terrible. How dare I go for it? And then I would write from two o'clock until eight o'clock and I'd be exhausted and I'd go give the talk and at the end people say, oh, that was great. That was really good. So I was, I was actually escalating and getting worse. And it was, so it was a really a, a, a very dysfunctional sequence in the life of a person who appeared very functional and who was very functional in many ways. But this, in this area, it was a, it was not, and it would drive me nuts. And actually it would generate migraine headaches when I was not getting the sleep and I was doing it. So what did I do? I went to a behavior therapist uh, in New York City and, uh, and then he started helping me with it. And he basically did uh, absolutely straightforward exposure treatment, exposure and response prevention, uh, and, uh, and in DBT skills terms, he didn't call it this, but it was the skill of acting opposite the emotion, the urge that goes with the emotion. So what was the urge that goes with the emotion? My urge was clearly to over-prepare. So what did he have me do? He had me have five consecutive, whatever are the next five talks I was giving, 
uh, I had a schedule where I could only prepare for two hours at the first one, an hour and a half the second one, an hour the third one, an hour and a half, a half hour the fourth one, and zero preparation for the fifth one. And, I, and that I had to commit to that, and he had me commit, commit to that, and that I had to experience the fear, which was not a problem. I definitely experienced panic before every one of these. And oh my God, what do you mean? I can only do two hours of preparation, a half hour of preparation, zero preparation. And the zero preparation came at the end when I was about to give a talk at an international symposium in Italy, where I was the junior person along with some famous psychiatrists. And, I, and, and that was my actually my last two talks in this series of five were those, a half hour for one of them and zero for another one. So I went through this and I was shaking and I was frightened and, and I would just try to distract my mind before the talks. It didn't help to obsess about them because I knew I wasn't going to be able to prepare. So I would just uh, do some preparation. I had to narrow it down and create a little outline or something like that and then just talk. And, these, and every talk went fine, including the last two that I got, in fact, the last one was my first talk ever about DBT. It was about how to put DBT on an inpatient program, during which I just told them how I did it and what we had to consider and which people really liked. So I thought, oh my God. And, and that experience transformed me for the rest of my life. I mean, that's not an overstatement. It's not overblown. I have a deep respect for exposure treatment when it's done well. Uh, because he really did it well, and I and and I was a good student, which some people we work with are not that good a student, and they don't really comply, and they don't really commit, and things like that. But if you do, it does somehow get into that emotion regulation system that's in the middle of every one of us, and it changes it. If you really are struggling with what I was struggling with, and I think though this is a particular problem about public speaking fear. Uh, it overlaps with others, as I hope you'll know by the end of this talk. And actually, my ultimate goal would be that anybody that listens to this uh, consider what you wrestle with yourself or with, if you work with clients, what they wrestle with and see if you can map it out in this way. Because let me tell you what the map is now that I told you that experience. Here's the map as I think of it right now. This is sort of my way today of thinking of this. I sort of think of this as that there are three panels Think of physical panels, you know, like the way people make posters. And so, you know, you've got the middle panel, the panel on your left, the panel on your right. So let's say, and, and this is the sequence from left to right of an emotion, of regulating an emotion. And this overlaps with other uh, models within DBT, like the model for emotions that's in emotion regulation training skills. It also overlaps with behavioral chain analysis. So there's nothing new under the sun here of what I'm saying, but it's my way of, of visualizing it. And I'm hoping to make it simple enough that I don't actually need to draw it for you, though I'm willing to with the options available on Zoom. And if I decide to, I just will, because since I'm not going to find out from you if it's a good idea or not. But I want you to visualize the left panel. The left panel, you might say, is the input panel, the middle panel, the throughput panel, and the right panel is the output panel of an emotion. So what's the input panel consist of? Overall, it consists of a balancing act between things that render one vulnerable to the emotion, uh, on one side of the teeter-totter, and the other side is things that protect one. So there's the protective factors and the vulnerability factors uh, that are there when you head into a situation that trigger an emotion. And what are these made up of? I think of three categories. They may, they're made up of um, history. So you, let's say I'm about ready to give a talk, and I'm anticipating it, and I'm already anxious. What, what's my in, what is my left panel, you might say? What's the left input panel? What are my vulnerabilities and protective factors? Well, the vulnerabilities are that I've, I've acquired a pattern by then of really being freaked out about giving talks and thinking they'll go badly and worrying about them and thinking I have to over-prepare in order to make it go okay, if not perfect. So I'm, I'm already got that. It's, it's my biology. It's my history. I've had some negative experiences. It renders me vulnerable for the specific trigger, prompting event, activating event 
the specific event of getting ready to give a talk. So already I'm, I come into it with these factors going on and they're based on my history, they're based on my biology, and they're based on the context. I tried to think today, does that cover all the, all the waterfront? Uh, and for me, so far it does, though I'm willing to change it in a moment's notice. But I sort of think, no, we enter into every situation, every situation with some combination of vulnerabilities based on our history, based on our uh, biology, and based on the particular context we're entering into, which might be different than other contexts. Like for instance, right now, all of us, every one of us is facing every day in the context of the pandemic. In the context of the pandemic, it, it has various ways of that context renders us biologically more vulnerable. Why? Well, none of us have the same rhythms we had before. None of us have the same routines we had before. None of us have the same sleep pattern exactly, or the same eating pattern exactly, or the same exercise pattern, or the same socializing pattern dealing with our issues of attachment. I mean, nothing's the same. Now, some people preserve things pretty well, some people don't preserve things very well, but every one of us is rendered more vulnerable to every activating emotional event, one way or another, by this situation. So that's just something about how important context is and how sometimes the solution to your emotional problems, your emotional regulation problems, is going to be to be alert to your context, mindful of your context, changing your context, modifying your context, or maybe it's going to be modifying your biology. And we know, all know lots of things to do with modifying our biology, I mean, regulating ourselves. And, um, and, and, and they're within the emotion regulation skills package in DBT, for instance, the ABC please skills are all about making yourself more resilient, less vulnerable, protecting yourself, getting yourself, you know, more ready to deal with emotions. Um, so that's what I mean by the left panel. I'll be returning to it because I actually think you can apply it to every single situation of somebody who's trying to change what happens next which is now, let's say you move from the left panel to the middle panel. What's in the middle panel? Because the middle panel in this talk and in this way of thinking is absolutely central. It's sort of like where the problem lives. It lives in the middle panel. It gets, it gets transacted and retransacted and done over and over again in the middle panel. And what was going on in the middle panel made it impossible for me, even a pretty smart person who had pretty successful experiences to change my fear, which actually was going up, of giving talks. Um, so what's going on in the middle panel? Three main things, okay? Um, number one, and we all know these things if you know DBT, because uh, they're in the model of emotions, but I think this is where hmm, you really got to get in there and change this in order to change your chronic patterns. One is the prompting event. So that the prompting event, of course, bears a very intimate relationship to the left panel. Why? Well, in me, there were all kinds of events that happened earlier in my life that were part of my history that got programmed into my biology, which I already was a pretty sensitive person in some ways and sort of heightened sensitivity. So I had those things. And so I was already, you know, ready to be triggered if I was going to be giving a talk. So the prompting event is no accident, it's a prompting event. Let's say you grow up with a lot, you're born with a lot of anxiety because some people are born more shy, more fearful, more anxious than others. 20% of Americans are born in the category that are considered more shy and fearful. Um, that's a temperament. If you have that temperament to begin with, and then you grow up in a family that has heightened sensitivity to what the neighbors think about us, you're more likely to have your anxiety channeled in that way, right? Where you're gonna now be highly sensitive to what people think of you and what people think of your friends and what people think of your family. If, you're fa if you grow up with that level of sensitivity, but you grow up in a family that doesn't give a damn about what the neighbors think, but does give a damn about what you eat, how much you eat and what your body looks like, you could become highly sensitized to that. So now your future prompting events are gonna be intimately related to the left panel, which is your history and your biology and your context by then. So I just want to make that point that there, it isn't like these are very separate. And actually, if you change 
what goes on in that middle panel that I'm going to talk about. Actually, it will gradually and eventually change what's going on in the left panel. So what's going on in the middle panel is there you have a prompting event and what does it do? It sets off interpretations and it sets off emotions. And the emotions might set off interpretations and the interpretations might set off emotions. And sometimes it's hard to figure out which came first, the interpretation or the emotion. In some ways, from a clinical point of view, it doesn't matter as much because they're both relevant. So if you're a cognitive therapist, you're trying to change what's in those interpretations. And, it'll, and if you do it effectively, it will help change what's in the box of emotions and what comes next in the, in the right-hand panel. So, but you've got um, in the interpretations, my interpretations would be, for instance, prompting event, I've got a talk I'm gonna have to give tomorrow. Interpretations, oh my God, I know it's gonna go badly. Oh my God, if I don't prepare all night, I, it's just not gonna make, oh my God, if, if I don't really like overdo it, I won't be able to do it. Oh my God, they're gonna dislike me. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got a, a, a little box of interpretations pervade, pervading my experience of the middle panel. And I've got this emotion of fear. And the fear gets going. And the fear has a biology to it. Heartbeat, you know, my breathing is going. My, my palms are sweaty. Uh, I have trouble going to sleep. I'm activated. My sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive. Uh, probably cortisol streaming through my body. So there's a lot of biological changes that are essentially part of the emotion. Then there's a subjective sense of the emotion, which is if somebody were to say, how are you feeling? And if I was honest, which I probably wouldn't have been back in those years, and say, I'm terrified. I don't know, I'm panicky. I, I think I might fall down when I'm giving a lecture. I don't think I can make it. I mean, so there was that experience of panic going on. And so there's right, the biology in the middle panel there that it, that's all part of the emotion and the subjective sense of what it is, which is how do you feel? And third, the urge. The urge that's associated with that emotion because every intense emotion comes, brings with it, extremely importantly, an action urge. Why is it extremely important? Because it's probably the whole point biologically in evolution of why that emotion came into being and why it is maintained and why it works. Because if you have an urge to run away from a frightening animal, it's gonna keep you alive. So urges are, the, are a critical part of an emotion and they are a critical part in trying to change your emotional responses. So what happens with the urge? The urge is the, you might say, the operative element that moves you into the third panel, which is the output panel. Now the middle panel is like your experience of the prompting event, the interpretations, and the emotion, right? Keep in mind, you've got three things in this middle panel and they all interact with each other in an ongoing way. And they all, there's a three-way transaction that's going on that you want to do something about if you're gonna change an emotion regulation. But here's where it goes, is pressure builds in that middle panel. And where's the pressure go? It fuels the urge. So it fuels the urge to, for me, to over-prepare. It fuels the urge to, for some people, to, um, to walk out. It fuels the urge to be quiet and isolate. It fuels the urge to criticize yourself. It fuels the urge to harm yourself if you have a problem of harming yourself. It fuels the urge to suicide, depending what the circumstances are. All these urges are just unbelievably important, and they are related to the emotion. So fear typically pushes, drives the urge of get the hell out of here. And shame drives the urge of cover up because you're gonna do something that's very embarrassing and probably socially inappropriate. Um, anger drives the urge of strike out and break through the barrier, whether it's somebody who's insulting you and hurting you, or whether it's some, some, something important to you that is being blocked that you're trying to break through. So. These urges, whatever they are, are really important to get. And to get, I'd say clinically or personally, that includes uh, to get better at what I'm talking about today, you have to learn to feel the urge. You have to say, 
oh my God, here it is. I've got to get the hell out of here. And then, because then as we know, at least with some of these, we're going to decide to oppose the urge and go the opposite direction. But you have to feel the urge in the first place uh, before you can actually kind of get what really would be the opposite of the urge. Because it's not scripted. Nobody else knows the opposite of your urge. It's highly individualized exactly what you should do. So let's go back to, you've got panel on the left, panel in the middle, and now we've moved into the panel on the right, which is driven, we've been driven into that panel by the urge. Now our various expressions, our various expressions of the emotion uh, arrive and are uh, shaped by the urge. So the, the expression might be the expression of panic in our face, in our bodies, the expression of panic in words, the expression of panic in what we do, the expression of anger, the expression of shame. So we're already, the urge you might say is surrounded by or accompanied by the various forms in which the emotional expression takes. And now listen up, because this, this is a critical place. That urge could go in various directions. There's actually a choice point here. And it's the critical choice point when I was treated uh, by um, this psychologist for uh, uh, public speaking fear. Um, because my urge, once we identified it, was to over-prepare. So specifically, I had to not over-prepare. But here's the important thing, and this is where Linehan, in, in talking about this part of her treatment, emphasizes you have to figure out if the urge and the emotion behind the urge fit the facts of the situation. Sometimes that's said rather loosely when people talk about DBT. To me, exactly what that means is, does the urge and the emotion fit the prompting event? The prompting event should be a reality event. It's, it's not an interpretation. It's the fact of the matter. The prompting event is the fact of the matter. I'm going to be giving a talk. Prompting event, if you have PTSD and you were sexually traumatized during your life, prompting event is when you encounter a cue that, that is in some way associated with that original event, which rendered you so vulnerable. Now that's a prompting event. It's a real thing. So does the urge drive you in a direction that actually will solve the prompting event or somehow fix the prompting event or do something positive about the prompting event? That's the key question. So if over-preparing actually fixed my prompting event in a reasonable way, um, then that's not a bad thing. I mean, urges, urges most of the time are good things. I mean, our urges are associated with emotions for good reasons, and we should mainly follow our urges except when they tell us to do something that's counterproductive or do something that actually doesn't fix the problem. So if you are afraid because there's a, 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 you're going into an encounter with somebody who frightens you, and so your answer to that is to smash your head into a wall. And you have an urge to beat yourself up, to try to get this out of your mind, to distract your mind. And you do something like that. You've got an urge to hurt yourself or an urge to get the hell out of there and don't come back for a year. These are understandable urges, but they actually don't address the prompting event in a realistic way that's actually gonna change anything. That's not really gonna change anything there. It's you just sort of like escaping from the intensity of the middle panel. The middle panel, the intensity of the prompting event, the interpretation and the biologically based emotion, it's to escape the intensity of that, but it's not solving anything. Then that's what Linehan means by the emotion and urge doesn't fit the facts. If it does fit the facts, like, like I'll tell you, for instance, my public speaking fear, um, my, I had an urge to over-prepare, but that particular urge didn't actually change the equation. 
it didn't reduce the emotion in the future. All future prompting events continued to be just as bad. It didn't really do it. However, once I was able to reduce the urge to overprepare by actually acting opposite it several times until I actually learned, my brain actually learned, you know what? It isn't as dangerous as you think. You can stand up there and talk with no preparation and it went okay. And that's a profound experience I wouldn't have let myself have. So once you do that, I still had urges to prepare and to be a good speaker. That's not a problem. If, you, if fear is generating the urge to become a better speaker and becoming a better speaker is important to you, then actually that's a healthy urge, you might say, or a, an urge you're willing to go with. Um, because there's, there is always a potentially positive component to an urge. So there's this choice point that comes in the third panel. When you're experiencing an urge, where am I going with this urge? The urge is a way of the emotion endowing you with energy, endowing you with motion. Where do you go with it? Maybe if you go, let's say you have, I'm going to talk later, or maybe not even get to it today. I'm going to talk about the because it isn't taught as frequently, the, er, the uh, emotion of envy. And the emotion of envy, typical prompting events for envy are um, when somebody else gets something, has something that you wish you had, or they get credit for something that you wish you had credit for, they have something physical you wish you had, they have a certain quality you wish you had, and you envy it, right? And, and that moves into the middle panel, envy with associated interpretations, the prompting events for envy. But envy can be a very good thing, right? It, once you get into the urge associated with envy, it can be different urges. So a healthy urge associated with envy would be to get better at what you do so that you have it too. Maybe it'll fuel you to actually um, improve what you do or go after what you want to go after as long as it's something somewhat realistic. I mean, and so it might, it might create mm, striving. It might create ambition. It might create higher performance. It might learning. I mean, any number of things that, that aren't, if they aren't overdone, they're a good thing, right? You, you can, envy can drive a lot of that on the, so envy isn't, envy is sort of like, um, I don't know. I think people think of it as one of the ugly emotions. People are ashamed. I'm ashamed in talking about envy. And I, and I have my own, I'm working on my own lifelong envy that came out of my history and my biology and certain contexts. And in working on that, um, I've figured this out that actually there's some real problems with uh, some urges that grow out of envy are actually not going to help the situation that set off the envy in the first place. They're just escapes. So you have to distinguish which ones are just escapes, which actually are problematic, which actually don't fix anything and actually make you worse in some ways and set off other problems. And then which parts of the urge are actually things that lead towards problem solving? Because where does problem solving take you? Problem solving takes you back into the middle panel. You're back in the middle panel. And ultimately, I think what you're trying to do when you're trying to change your fundamental internal way to regulate emotions, you have to stop going down that escape road in the right-hand panel. You just have to cut off the escapes. You have to stop doing what those things you're doing if you can. In DBT, that's what, what distress tolerance skills are all about. That's what contingency procedures are all about if you're a therapist with somebody. It's to get people to stop going down that road of following escapist urges. Because the escapist urges are addictions. They are eating disorders. They are self-harm. They are violence. They are dissociation. They are self-judgment and self-criticism and self-loathing. They are blaming other people for everything. All of these are escapist urges. And so you've got, if you're going to be serious about changing your chronic relationship to a particularly painful emotion that keeps coming up, you've got to, one task you have to do is to get yourself back from the third panel into the middle panel. And, and if you 
grab hold or make use of the energy of an urge to go into problem solving, that means you're going back into the prompting events and you're changing how you manage the prompting events. Like I found after I went through the public speaking fear treatment and I was doing better and, I, and it started to seem like, wow, this is actually not that hard. I still prepare, but I don't over prepare. I can even sleep before it because I learned that even if I just stand up there, even in the face of fear, and I just go through it, and I experience that fear, and I give the talk, and it goes okay, I realized I learned a new skill. The new skill was to believe that if I have something in my head, and if I stand up and talk, it will come out. It might not come out elegantly. It might not come out the way I originally intended it to come out. But you know what? It'll come out. And that's a, the podcasts. I mean, I never know how I'm going to tell these things even in the podcast, but I know if I keep talking and I've got these in here, they will come out and I'll be able to modify them on the way out. Once I picked up that skill and I only picked it up after I was able to stop with the over preparation. So these things are all intimately related. Changing how you manage the third panel by not going down the escapist road, but pulling yourself back towards the middle panel and st which means staying with your emotion. It means being mindful of your interpretations. And it means trying to problem solve the prompting events. Those three things. Regulate that emotion with all the ways you can. Address those interpretations and ask yourself, and that's where the skill of checking the facts comes in. Is this really the facts of the matter, the way I'm thinking about it, that actually everybody is going to think I gave a bad talk? Well, does history support that? No, not really. I, not always great talks, but they go okay. And it isn't so bad. So uh, history, so you can check the facts. But I always found that checking the facts by itself doesn't do enough for me with the ones that are chronic and repetitive and painful and difficult. They keep coming back anyway. I mean, I can tell myself a thousand times, no, you, this, this won't go that way. You, you've experienced this before. People said, blah, 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 blah. You can check the facts and actually, then you're exposed to the prompting event again. Boom, there it is again. It's really hard to change. And I think the acting opposite gives you a real chance to get back in there, block the escape of Sturge, stay in the middle panel, be mindful of the thoughts, be aware of the emotion, be mindful of the emotions and look at the prompting event and see what you can do if you can do something about it. And guess what? If you start re-regulating what's going on in that middle panel, over time it changes what's going on in the left panel. I hope you're following me. This, this, you know, I watch these because of, because of the pandemic, I have watched more Netflix and Prime Video things than I've ever watched before, like these series of, dete of detectives, and they get so many subplots going that by the time we're 40 minutes into one, I have no idea who's who. I mean, sometimes it's like, who did that? Wait a minute. I hope that isn't your experience of this because I feel like I'm jumping around, but I'm trying to get across the three panels that I'm talking about. So if you change the middle panel, if you change the middle panel, if you change the relationship between the prompting event, the interpretations, and that automatic biologically based emotion, because you've done something different with the urge again and again and again, and you get and you stay with things, what will eventually happen is your experience of the left-hand panel will change. Why will it change? First of all, you start creating a new history. So the history for me, starting in my late 30s of giving talks, I have a hope my history just started to change. It didn't change immediately, but the more I did it without so much panic and without so much over preparation. The more I did it, the more I started to think, oh, I'm developing a new history here. I'm actually changing my history. You know, I'm layering the previous history over with this history. I'm also changing my biology. The more times you give a talk that you're terrified of, but you get up and do it, and you do it, and you really get into it, and you let yourself experience the fear and the panic, and you go through it and do it, it actually starts to change your biology just the way those with the biology of PTSD. Because what I'm talking about is all about PTSD treatment too. The treatment of panic and terror that you're going to be traumatized again 
by something like the original event or some earlier event is that's what PTSD treatment is all about. It's what Melanie Harned's treatment is all about. And it's what other exposure-based treatments are about. So, you know, it's sort of like you actually change your biology over time. You actually change your history over time. And you start to encounter prompting events that in previous years would have done you in, in a way that if they don't do you in now, you can go through them. It's not an immediate process, but you know, you know, I just, I had, uh, I taught a, a skills group that I have this week, yesterday. And I, in addition to other things that we taught, I showed them, I, I just put on screen share something that maybe many of you have watched, but it has all these principles in it, which is the uh, treatment of a snake phobia uh, that you can see if you just went to YouTube and typed in a snake phobia treatment, Boston University. And you'll get this 12 minute clip of a woman who had a snake phobia all of her life, in other words, a fear-based disorder. And oh my God, was it clear in this clip when, because, because she is treated successfully in three hours, not three weeks, not three years, three hours. I mean, by the end of three hours, she was holding this giant snake, giving it a, an affectionate name, and then talking, though you could tell she was still frightened, but boy, what, what change happened? The change happened because the therapist understood this and he helped her to act opposite her urge to avoid the snake, to run away from the snake, even though intellectually she knew this was not a dangerous snake. But that didn't work. She had had a snake phobia where she grew up in South America all of her life. And now she's in her 30s and she's still panicked of snakes. So he brings the, this, the prompting event and she starts to become more skillful. She starts to take the urge about it and she starts to channel the urge in a way that just informs her to be cautious with the snake, to be gentle with the snake, to be careful with the snake, but actually to approach the snake and learn that act actually did not damage her. As she even says at one moment in the clip, uh, she says, he says, so did it kill you? And she says, no, I, it didn't kill me. You know, and that's a very important thing to learn. It didn't kill me. I mean, so, um, all right. I think I've gotten the, the main, I mean, I think it, all of these things change. It's, it's another uh, way of thinking systemically. If you think of all the ingredients I just laid out in these three panels, there's probably about 15 ingredients, 14, 13. I, I haven't mapped them out in that clear way, but there's a bunch of ingredients. These, these are the factors that maintain a problematic emotion, something you can't change, whether it's fear or shame or anxiety or sadness that won't go away or anger that comes up at the drop of a hat. All of these things, I think, operate with some of these same principles. And that's actually one of the brilliant things that Linehan did, because she took this model that was developed what I've just described, the, and the model of exposure and response prevention, was developed in the context just of fear and anxiety-based disorders. In fact, some of it by David Barlow, who was the director of the BU Center for Anxiety and its treatment. Um, so she took that and said, gee, I think this would work with all emotions. But that's not what anyone else was doing at the time. But it, it's sort of like she created the template that was built by other people uh, on fear and anxiety treatment, treatment of OCD, treatment of PTSD, um, treatment of, uh, of phobias. And she said, oh, you know, the, we could apply these same principles. And the more I've looked at it, the more I think, boy, she was spot on. I mean, and if I get to envy, I'll talk to you a little about envy. Envy is an interesting one. And I hesitated to, to bring it up. Um, just because I realized it made me feel ashamed. So one of the things that shame does in treatment is it makes people not address what really needs to be addressed because they're ashamed of whatever else they're doing. And so shame is this invisible mm, stranglehold on learning to change. And it's just there. So I thought, the other day I thought, I, I think I'll go on at this podcast and I'll talk about this because it's what I'm actively working on. The public speaking thing I did like half a lifetime ago. But I'm doing this now. 
after a lifetime of dealing with this. So I thought, should I talk about it? And I thought, no, but I, I feel like what will people think of me? I mean, I'm walking around with shame. And if you hear what it, it's like, oh, this is an ugly emotion. And then I thought, wait a minute, Charlie. The prompting event of thinking of talking to you guys about envy is setting off the emotion of shame in me. And the emotion of shame in me comes with the urge to hide and cover up. And therefore I won't get, you know, and so what am I gonna do about that? Now I've got two emotional problems, two emotions to regulate. They have to be done in sequence. Because first, if I'm gonna regulate this and teach you about it, about the envy, I have to act opposite the urge that goes with my shame. So once I get into the third panel with shame, I'm already thinking, no, I got, I, I, I got to not share this. I'll, I'll just share something else. And then I thought, no, I can't do that. I can't be true to this treatment and true to myself if I do that. It's not going to help me grow if I just avoid things. So I thought, okay, I'll share this. You know? And if all of you guys th think less of me because of this, you, know, you just will. <laughs> I don't see most of you most of the time anyway, but I, it won't actually be a big problem for me because I've sort of been thinking about it all week and thinking, you know what, I should just do this. And the more I thought about it, the more I've realized it, the more I got into the interstices, into the gory details of envy, I've realized it's just like everything else. It's just another emotion. It comes with a lot of energy. It comes with urges. It comes with functions. It comes with interpretations that are typical. So why am I, so why in the left panel am I sensitive? Am, do I have heightened sensitivity to envy? And you know what? It's not, a, it doesn't take rocket science if you knew me to know. I grew up in a family where my oldest brother was a very high achiever uh, at what he did. And I don't need to go into details because it'll take too long that way. But let's just take it from me. I grew up six years younger than a guy who seemed to be just like a prince. I mean, just could do everything. And what was, but that in itself wasn't the, the huge problem. There was also a problem that I cared, whatever, wherever that came from, I cared how I did. And I grew up comparing myself to him. And I grew up hearing my father talk in a rapturous way about how much talent my oldest brother had in what he did. I mean, at one point, my father said in a gathering of social social gathering that I was there as a kid, I can remember my father saying, gosh, I wish I had, I would give my right arm to have the amount of talent that my oldest son has in his little finger. And I heard that. Oh my God, if one statement would have made a big difference in someone's life with the way I was already constructed, it was like, oh my God. So I'm, always, I'm already thinking, um, God, I wish I had what my oldest brother had. God, it's amazing what he has. And it led to all kinds of complicated feelings about him over the years. But also that whole thing, and it's probably informed my biology in that I was more tight, more narrow, more focused, more rigid about accomplishing things that would get me some kind of credit of the kind of credit that he got, even though it never would make that difference. I could have, I could have done, I could have become a Nobel Prize winner and it would not have changed this. I mean, I guarantee you, because I've already done a lot of things, right, that, that I've gotten credit for and I've done well, etc. And I still have this shadow. And I realize I've got to deal with this shadow. You know, I'm only 70 years old. Who knows how much longer I have to live? I mean, so um, I've got to deal with this envy problem. So there I am. That's the, the left panel. There was a history within my family, as there often is with people who have things like this and probably maybe always, um, and, and a biology that probably went with that. And then certain contexts where there's heightened competition. I mean, I, I grew up, my goal in life was not what my oldest brother was doing, and maybe that was good, but the problem was I grew up aiming for something that I didn't have the capacity to fulfill. So that was actually pretty devastating. By the time I was 16, I figured out I was not going to be an NBA basketball player, which was all I ever wanted to be and all I spent my weekends doing, and all I spent my evenings doing, and, and I was just in love with basketball and the NBA. I, and um, being a good student was a nice thing, but that actually was not my passion. Um, 
but then I found I couldn't do that. And I transferred a lot of that to becoming a good student. And I was, and I got myself in situations where comparisons between people were very intense. I mean, I grew up thinking I'd go to University of Oregon and play basketball and then be an NBA player and then be a coach. But then that fell apart when I was still pre applying to colleges. So then what did I apply to? I went to, I went to Harvard where there's, it's just loaded with competition and loaded with really smart people and comparisons going on all the time and it's sort of like, oh my God. So I put myself in a context that continued to inflame this experience. And so what was the experience? If you get into the middle panel, there every prompting, what would be a prompting event for envy for me as well as for other people that have envy as a, a, vulnerable, a vulnerability? Um, a prompting event for envy would be if I noticed somebody else get credit for something that I thought I should have, or that I thought I could have, or that I thought I should have done, uh, or maybe I should do tomorrow. It's sort of like if I would hear about somebody that succeeded, somebody that got recognition or credit or something, I wouldn't share this with anyone else, certainly, but I would experience in myself this kind of like um, craving and this kind of, uh, oh my God, I should have done that, or what's wrong with me, or why is that person better than me, or they did the right thing at the right time and I didn't, or, and that would get going in this interpretation box, and it was kind of painful, and the, and the emotion would get going of envy, which, you know, would include a sense of uh, resentment, uh, it would blend into a sort of a craving for something, a coveting of something that I didn't have, um, and you would think by, if you're in the middle panel with me, oh my God, does he think he has nothing? And I knew I had things, but I would undersell them to myself. I would not count my own blessings, not count my own accomplishments, but I would overcount what other people had. And it would, and it would lead to urges. So what kind of urges would carry me into the third panel? Um, the urge to, um, discredit myself, the urge to uh, overly credit another person, and then the urge to discredit another person, find ways in which actually they were not as good as that, and trying, and, and they would lead to urges to be stingy so that I wouldn't be likely to express my appreciation of what someone else did that actually was wonderful. Instead, I would get caught up and, and yet I, I knew enough to not socially act that out, but I still would get caught up inside with this experience, which would inhibit me. And then when I look back, there's so many times I wish I had gone to someone and said, that was wonderful, that was fabulous. And I do some of that, but I'd pick my spots about that. And so that's what I feel bad at, but then I feel ashamed about that. But it's sort of the urge would go in that direction to, either find the holes in someone else's argument or in someone else's resume, someone else's credit, discredit someone, but also be discrediting myself, but then try to boost myself up. But that never seemed to work very well for me. So what was the opposite action that I now need to take part in? I mean, because like I said, the, the envy can be a wonderful thing if you can channel it into striving and say, you know what, I want to do this better. And that has worked that way for me. So it isn't all a negative thing. But the negative part I've shared with you because it doesn't solve the problem. It would never say, it would never change the prompting event if I discredit someone else or if I undercredit myself or overcredit or all this sort of apportionment of credit is a problem. So what will make a difference in the middle panel, which is what I'm really ultimately talking about in every one of these cases. Ultimately, the thing that'll make the difference is if I figure out the escape, figure out the way in which this urge does not fit the facts, and if I go opposite the urge. So what I've been thinking lately, this week, and starting to practice it more and more, is to um, credit other people, uh, express appreciation where my gut, my, my emotion is telling me, no, 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 don't do that. You're just giving them more credit. Oh, it's so crazy. And I'm realizing it's so crazy. So crediting other people, appreciating other people, counting my own blessings, 
in, and, and, ex, and ex, feeling and expressing gratitude, that these are the things that go against envy, because envy and gratitude kind of, they kind of go opposite each other in that respect. So if you can do these things over and over again, and really do it, as Linehan says when she talks about these skills, you have to figure out how to do it all the way so that you aren't just sort of like saying, well, let me give this person a little bit of credit. No, actually, go for it. Go all out. I mean, realize that, you know, that you're stuck in a very small place when your envy controls your actions, your envy controls your expressions. So to me, that's where I'm at right now using this scheme, trying to work on the envy problem. Um, so I'm, I see I'm within like one or two minutes of being at the end. Um, I, I think, it, strangely enough, I thought I was going to take two podcasts to cover what I'm talking about. I think I've gotten it across uh, as best as I can think of right now. I love to hear back from people. So if any of you, of you want to um, send me an email, uh, either through the website or if you just or if you know my email address, I always appreciate that. And about this one in particular, because I'm kind of putting myself out there as a as a with an example, as you can hear. And uh, in its and in itself, I think that's I'm trying to uh, treat myself. You know, therapist, treat thyself. Uh, I could say to everybody that I've ever supervised, as well as uh, that's how I I need to work too. So look, everybody, of course, everybody, take care of yourselves and remain safe. I hope that this was useful to you, to put it this way. If you already knew all of this, that's great. I mean, it's just a different way to put it with these three panels or thinking this way. So um, um, uh, thanks for hanging in there. I see that we have the same number of people that started. That's always better than if you lose people along the way. So that's a good thing. Um, okay. And uh, I haven't decided what I'm talking about next. You know, I kind of, I kind of got derailed when the pandemic came, and I did two, two of these uh, with people in Italy about the experience of Italy and the United States during the uh, pandemic, and with DBT. And so, uh, and then I, I sort of, that was it for a while. And now I've got to get myself back in gear and, and think about what things I want to talk with you about, which have to be meaningful to me, and, and most of these are. So. Adios, everybody. Oh, I'm getting some feedback now. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, it's very nice. Very nice to hear these things. Now, now you've just uh, reinforced me for oversharing. <laughs> I'm kidding, but obviously, uh, I appreciate it a lot. So, write me if you if you have some specific things to say, and I hope you can use these things yourself uh, or with other people. So, bye. See you next time. Bye.